is Denise Krupp, and we are here today uh, talking with two individuals, Romeo Musical and Pat Piercy, and we're having this conversation because October is Filipino American Month, and I'm just so delighted that the two of you agreed to, to talk with me. Uh, so if I could share a little bit about your history and ask your sure. questions for you. So Romeo, you were part of the first class of Filipino Americans at the Naval Academy. Right. Uh, myself and Valerie Ivanova were the first Filipinas to graduate in 1983. Uh, and so uh, that was uh, a very interesting time, uh, exciting time. Uh, we still keep in touch. And uh, yeah, we, uh, we were really involved in a lot of social activities there. I don't know because we wanted to get out of the, the, <laughs> the, the company area, but yeah. I certainly did. I, I was very, very very uh, involved in a lot of sports and choirs and so forth. And your dad was part of an incoming class in 1953, which means, if I have those years right, he was still on active duty. Yeah, yeah, there was, there was a very short period, maybe two or three years, where uh, we were both active duty. Okay. And uh, I said, you don't need to so please don't so need that. <laughs> but I did go to his retirement, of which I okay. was so honored to be there. Um, he he enlisted in the Navy in 1953 from Sangley Point, um, uh, Cavite, Philippines, uh, the Naval Station there. About 3,000 gentlemen were of that first class, right. and that was the largest recruiting class ever in the history of the Navy, anywhere in the world. And uh, he, uh, he and two buddies uh, from the same hometown in uh, the Philippines of Batangas joined. And um, 30 years later, each of them have a child that graduated in 1983. Wow. And, okay. uh, and today we're still best of friends. And uh, we have such a, uh, a wonderful uh, memory and of the academy, and one of, one of the three of us really, really did so successfully in the in the military, and I'm really proud of them. Okay. Their names are Vic Mercado, who uh, retired as the Assistant Secretary of Defense. Mm -hmm. uh, he was also uh, retired as a Rear Admiral, okay. and then Peter Medibo. Okay. Uh, and we, we we both didn't do naval careers, but. Right. Uh, so very happy to be part of it. All right, well, I'm going to talk about your career and your dad's career, but I have a question real fast for Pat. So I have to say that you retired as a admiral, but you started as a uh, midshipman at the Naval Academy, and I think you were two years behind. Right, right so I was a class of 1985, so two years later. Okay, and were you a Navy, Navy brat? So uh, <clears throat> not really. So I grew up in Oklahoma. And uh, my uncles were in the Navy, but mm -hmm. by the time, you know, when I grew up, I, you know, I really had no exposure to the Navy other than, you know, I sort, I sort of joke, uh, McHale's Navy, mm -hmm. and, you know, Gilligan's Island, okay. you know, and so, uh, but for some reason, uh, I was, I built model ships instead of tanks mm -hmm. or aircraft, and so the Navy's had always interested me, and so eventually I decided to, uh, to apply for a commission, and, uh, or the programs, you know, the leading to the commission, and I ended right. up having some options, and I decided to go to the Naval Academy. Okay. Did your uncles encourage you to come in? No one did. Actually, I had to convince my dad. I, I, oh, I, to, okay. I, I finished That's two years as a chemistry yeah. major at the University of Texas, Texas at Arlington. I decided uh, I want, at that point that I wanted to go into the Navy and get a commission. And so going to the Naval Academy, I had to start over. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a four-year program. I could have stayed in a couple of other programs and just finished my degree in two years, but I decided if I'm going to get a commission, I want to go to the Naval Academy. So I, you know, so I decided. So I, I was actually a class of '79 for high school. So I probably would have been a class of '83 if I had yeah, gone straight to the Naval Academy. That's right. Okay. Would have. So, but since I decided to, uh, you know, to, to go to the Naval mm -hmm. Academy, I had to wait. So. But it worked out great because I think it made it a little bit easier for me. Yeah. You mm -hmm. know, in terms of being a little mature yeah. and coming instead of coming straight out of high school. So sure. the whole okay. first year, the plea right. year, wasn't as stressful. I mean, it was stressful, but for me, it wasn't right. that stressful. Okay. So. Okay. So I'm 
parents. So you had to convince your dad, and if I, if I read your story correctly, your dad's like, you need to go to Haiti. That's right. <laughs> All right, so, well, That's what so did, funny. So what did your dad say when you were like, I'm going to go to the Naval Academy? I mean, again, he said why, but, okay. but it wasn't... I mean, I was a pretty fairly independent self-starter, so mm -hmm. I, I, I say that in con well, I shouldn't say that in contrast. You know, so I, my children are now in the 12th and 11th grade, mm -hmm. and my daughter is going through the college selection process. Mm, right. And I'm thinking, my parents were in no way involved in my college selection process, and we're involved, but I'm trying not to be too involved because mm -hmm. we're raising independent yeah, children. Yeah. You know, but I'm thinking now it seems much more complicated than, mm. than certainly at least when, when I went Maybe through the whole process. And so, so I, had, I had a lot of flexibility. Okay. And, uh, you know, and, and, but part of it was trying to figure out what I, what was I really interested in. I was, originally was a chemistry major. Okay. Actually, I wanted to be a soccer referee, so if you want to really okay. get okay. into it. So <laughs> soccer, so, so right. North Texas had really good soccer, so, right. so I said, oh, no, I like chemistry, I'm good at sciences. And then after a year, I said, I don't really like chemistry, and I can't make a career right. uh, as, mm -hmm. a, uh, as a professional soccer referee. So okay. let's give the Navy a shot. And then, you know, 30, you know, four years and then 35 right. and a half years later, I retired mm -hmm. in the fall of 2020. And so, so it ended up being obviously a, a great career, great opportunities. And more than anything for me, you know, the opportunity to serve, mm -hmm. you know, that's a, I always sort of focus in on the naval service means to right. serve and then to right. the opportunity to lead. So, right. I, so in all respects, my career was was rewarding because of that. Okay. All right, so you, okay, you're, you're wanting to be a, a soccer referee, chemistry, 34 years in Navy. Um, were your uncles, in a, this is part of the story with the Navy, were, were they stewards? When you went, so when your uncles were So it's interesting, so again, going That's back into the Filipino yeah. side, so my, my uncles were on my father's side. So on my mother's side, so my mother's, so my mother's parents, my mother, her family immigrated from the Philippines after okay. World War II. Okay. So they lived in Manila during World War II. They both, they were doctors. And so mm -hmm. they ended up settling they, in, uh, in Oklahoma, in Clinton, where there was a TB sanatorium. So now, to me, it's sort of funny. So my father's side was the working class side. My, my grandfather was, you know, was... Uh, a mechanic and he ended mm -hmm. up having his own gas station and then my mother's side was sort of the professional side mm -hmm. both doctors and when my father proposed to my mother uh, by my my mother's parents were saying you know well he's my, my dad he's not mm -hmm. gonna amount much anything because <laughs> okay. no one in the family had gone to college you know he was wow, a high school yeah. you know so in other yeah. words you know they were farmers they were farmers and uh, and right. working class, and then sort of the educated class was mm -hmm. was on my mother's side with two two doctors, right. you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, so I so oh. I, I was sort of find it ironic, you know. And that my father ended up getting a PhD and was an investment oh. banker. Did well. Well, well, everything worked out okay. real well, obviously. But uh, but I, so it was my uncles. I had one, one my oldest uncle. My 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 father was the youngest four brothers. His oldest brother. Retired as a chief petty officer, I want to say in the '60s, okay. you know. And so, but and at that time he got to fly, so he was, mm. uh, so he flew small planes. But uh, but he was a chief. And the other, my grandfather was actually, uh, I want to say, he was 41 or 45. He had, when he was drafted in World War II, right. you know, he had four boys mm -hmm. and he was drafted, but it's like 40, 1944 or 45. So, mm -hmm. but when I grew up, that really was a Again, I wasn't exposed really to the Navy, okay. and I wasn't, you know, and I wasn't exposed to the Filipino culture actually to a great extent until I joined the Navy. Yeah. Because where mm -hmm. I grew up, there were there right. was no Filipino sure. community in, in Western Oklahoma or in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Okay. And when I visited my relatives, there just there wasn't just that, yeah. there was no real Filipino community. Now, in the Navy, certainly in our big fleet concentration areas, right. Right. you know, Norfolk, you know, Tidewater area, San Diego, Hawaii, even in the D.C. area, it's a very yeah. large yeah. Filipino very, community. Very, very large. So, so it wasn't until I actually 
started, you know, until I was in the fleet or when I was a midshipman, until I really started learning more mm -hmm. about my, my, my culture and my background. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> wow, okay, so that varies dramatically to what your experience was. Listening to my, uh, my godfather, who is a, the, the parent of the admiral, um, every recruit started as a steward. Every recruit, and the steward uh, really comprises of uh, cooks, right. uh, waiters, mess attendants, right. and the first ninety days of of um, that gentleman's uh, assignment would be also to shine the shoes of the officers, as well as to make their racks, make their right. bunks, uh, and then after ninety days of them doing that, they get to graduate to the kitchen. Blah, blah, but then after, after several years, I want to say five to seven years, they could strike to go into whatever field that they wanted to go into. Uh, some stayed as stewards. My dad uh, happened to be a, an assistant college professor uh, in the Philippines, and so he went right into administration, a yeoman. Uh, and then he stayed in that field for, for 30 years as a chief. And so... You're right. They they all started as 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 stewards, and that was that was a, a, a big challenge actually for them. A lot of them were professionals already right. um, uh, in their home country at the time, and uh, so you know they had to endure some uh, very tough assignments. Mm -hmm. You know uh, that they were not used to doing. Uh, not only that, because English was their second language. Um, there was a lot of mockery of their accent or m misuse of the English English language uh, from the native English speakers, sailors. Okay. And so they tried extremely hard to try and speak without the accent. I remember my father being a member of Toastmasters for years uh, to try and, and iron that out, iron right. that uh, accent out. So, yeah, they... Uh, you know that that is one of the main reasons why I joined um, the Navy to to honor my dad. Uh, he was only 23 when he was recruited. Um, he left his his home and his family, um, and to endure everything else, and then to uh, to become a U.S. citizen and live in the U.S. Really, they were their own uh, leaders. They were leaders. Them and you know in their in their right. Um, uh, you know, rightly so, they were they were leaders. Each you know, in one of them, each and every one of them, as they uh, kind of left their home country right. of the Philippines and served the United States. So when you when you talk about the class of fifty three, so it was nineteen fifty three. Yes, the in, right. And I think it was about thirty, you know, three thousand. Uh, yes, the number of recruits so he, in that he's year. Coming in with right three thousand. Most are coming in with college degrees. Yes, most. Mm -hmm. Now, or why, already practicing professionals. Or, or yeah. professionals. So why did they leave? What was the end benefit? I think they wanted to have a better life for their for their children. Quite right. frankly, um, and by doing so, they could also help the family members that would would remain in the Philippines by sending right. money or sending. Um, Items that would be of use uh, for them. So, um, so they that that was their main main focus, okay. and they were just hoping to be able to have their kids have a better life, and then to perpetuate that from generation to generation. Yeah, sure. So, yeah. okay. uh, I believe they were successful. You know, and Rear Admiral. Yes. You know, I think uh, our generation uh, was you know rightly represented and did extremely well. I think uh, there's much more that we can do, mm -hmm. but we're in that fine line where, timeline where you ask a young Filipino college person if their father or mother had served in that, mm -hmm. and you're, now they're saying no, because now these gen the generations have now assimilated into the United States in terms of um, college degrees and professions and so forth. So, you know, I think it's really important to be able to capture all of the, the historic uh, moments in these decades right. so that they don't, 
get lost, right. you know. Uh, and so that's that's the main reason why I'm here today. Okay. Um, what was it like growing up in the Navy? So you. I guess it's me, right? Well, you can well, start first. Well, but, 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 but actually, it's two parts. So it's one, growing up as a kid, but then the second part is growing up as a young officer. You know, and maybe kind of like, oh, well, but what should I have done as a young officer that I would, I should have told myself to do? So you want to try growing up first? I'll, and I'll do growing, growing up. up. Um, we had wonderful duty stations. Um, I particularly love the international duty stations. We went to Nor uh, Newfoundland, Canada for a couple of years, and then Yokosuka, Japan okay. for a couple of years. Uh, in particular, to be a kid in, let's say, Japan and to just see the wonderful culture and listening to the interesting language and of course there was no English on TV uh, but but most importantly it that whole base was so secure that we would just have breakfast at home and we would come back at sunset and we and a whole bunch of other kids would just go bowling or go to the swimming pool to the theater just give us a couple of dollars and our whole day would be planned. And it was so wonderful. And I'm still close friends with some of those people that I was seven years old. Do you think it years old. made it easier for you to go to the Naval Academy? And I say that as, as an Army brat. That yes, right. I, I grew up in this environment, it was very familiar, yes. and so when the time comes to come in, yeah, okay. Yes. Come in. Yeah. Do, you, do you think that it made did, it easier? It did help quite a bit. Because I, I remember distinctly when my dad was not home. And back then, it still was at least a minimum of a year, right. uh, which is a long, long time for children, right? Not having to see your father, but um, it, today is different in terms of the longevity of their. Uh, but it's there's different missions also. Yeah. So, you know, I saw how my mom also struggled as a single parent raising up five kids, right? And we were all two years apart. English was not her. Uh, they don't, was was not her first language and her going to school and so forth. So I, I did see a lot of that. And then ha I was lucky not to have to go to six elementary schools. But I was lucky that I was able to stay relatively in one um, right. area so as not to repeat grades and so forth. That's, that is that, that's rare. That's yeah, rare though. That is lucky. That's very lucky. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so let's go. For your career, so you're graduating in 85. When you graduated in 85, did you say, you know what, in 30 plus years, I'm going to be an admiral? So, no. Okay. Yeah. Just, so, just, you know. I mean, I, probably at the beginning, when I, most people probably, probably said, you're probably going to make it a career. Yeah. You know, so in my mind, I probably was going to make it a career. Okay. So, and, you know, ambitious, yes, you know, okay. but uh, I was certainly what I wanted to do was get to command. And so, you know, and so that obviously that takes time. But right. the uh, one thing, so the, as a one, it was great, go, great going to the Naval Academy. It was a great experience, you know. So, uh, and uh, some of my best friends are, you know, are from that time. Right. Right. And uh, uh, I've got to go to the Philippines on my, my right. first midshipman cruise. So it's third class cruise at the time. Okay. That's what we were doing. Right. And so, uh, it was the summer of 1982, so I met uh, the U in the USS Stare, the cruiser was uh, home ported in Subic Bay, and so I got to go to the Philippines, wow. and we, we went to Hong Kong, but I got to meet some of my relatives, so I, you know, yeah. took the trip into Manila, and, and that's the actually the only time I've been to the Philippines was in the summer of 1982, and I, there are other, op I just didn't have any other opportunities to go back. But then growing up as an officer, uh, you know, to, to me it's probably nothing unusual than even today. Mm -hmm. it, it depends on the quality of the wardroom and your friends, but I would say in general it's a great experience. Uh, a lot of travel. I was on a cruiser in the beginning, USS Mississippi, as a nuclear-powered cruiser at the time. Right. Now it's a submarine. Right. Uh, but uh, we, we made, uh, we trained down in the Caribbean and then our deployments were, were to the to Europe, so so it, I, I had a blast as a as a division officer. Some very good mentors, some very good leadership, very good commanding officers. You know, so it was uh, to me it was a very positive experience. We're gonna stop here, Rotas, because right. I can. So uh, 
you ended your career, if I read the bio correctly, as chief of staff for UCOM? Right. Okay, UCOM... Yes, you can come in. Yes, and you want to tell folks what you did? So, you know, as, a, as the world's divided up into geographic combatant commands, and they're functional mm -hmm. commands, but I was so... I. I've served at U.S. European Command twice, and before I was a director for operations at then U.S. Pacific Command, it's now U.S. Indo-Pacific Command. Okay. And uh, so, chief of staff, if, if you can imagine, you know, European Command is responsible for all U.S. military activities in Europe, European area of operations, and the chief of staff is responsible for uh, the functioning and the organization, the running of the staff. Then there's a deputy commander, a three-star at the time, uh, it was General uh, Twitty, who's an Army three-star, and then mm -hmm. the, the European Command Command, who's also dual-hatted as a Supreme Allied Commander of Europe. So the, he usually, that commander usually spends their time in Mons, when, where that headquarters is. And so, so it was what, what I would consider a typical chief of staff job, which was running of the staff. We do all the planning, looking ahead, you know, helping prepare, you know, the commander for various meetings, et cetera, the strategic planning, just the general, if you can imagine an organization where you have, you know, roughly, oh, I can't remember the exact number, it's 250,000 Americans and then, and then their families that are in Europe. So right. sitting on top of, you know, an organization that sits on top of that. The component commanders are sort of like service command equivalents, and then on top of that is a joint command. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I spent my whole my whole yes. career sort of working my way up. You know, to me, it was a natural transition from going from like director yeah. for operate. You know, right. when I was in the Pacific, I was responsible to, for to the commander for all all U.S. military operations in the Pacific. That's At the big. time, Kim Jong Un was mm -hmm. was in his last set of provocations with a nuclear test and the missile launches. Yeah. You know. Going over Japan and Sarah, so that was when I was the director for operations, and I left then to yeah. go. But probably the biggest event that was COVID, because sure. you know this was in the in the uh, spring and summer of 2020, and so I was managing running UCOM's COVID uh, response. Okay, I just have to say you're minimizing this. You were doing an amazing thing, and, and I say this having lived in UCOM in Heidelberg in 85 to oh, 88. Oh, really? So wow. I'm, I'm familiar with you, with oh. UCOM. So you had a big job with a yeah. lot of people and a lot right, of right. But again, it's interesting, things. as you know, and right. And so it's it's interesting. Sure. So if you think about yeah. it, it's if you think about it, when you start off as a division officer. You know, you're just responsible for division May 15 to 30, depending right. on how big it is. And then the, your department head and department head owns divisions, and then a command has departments. So as you sort of progress, you become more and more experienced. And so you get to a point, given, you know, I had, I had command of a carrier strike group, and so, you know, you've mm -hmm. got the carrier, the carrier air wing, a couple of cruisers and destroyers, right. and to me, right. You know, now I'm working with, with commanders and captains, 05s, 06s, so it's sort of a natural progression as a two-star, as a flag officer, you know, that I'm now sitting near the top of a much larger organization, mm -hmm. and I had a great staff, they're a great commander, you know, a great, a great team to work with, and so, you know, again, as, you know, I'm not, I'm not reaching down to like the E, the junior right. enlisted no, level, the, I'm, my, yeah. my peer group that I'm working with are, are you know admirals and, and general officers and colonels and, and captains, but that's but I've sort of it's sort of a natural progression. So so I appreciate it, you know. But you know that's sort of it took me 35 and a half years yes. to get to that point. It wasn't <laughs> something that I did, at, you know, at uh, you know one no, or two I years. Know. <laughs> well, what was the best thing you did? All right, so you did Endo Paycom and you've done UCOM. Which one do you prefer? Because you probably do have a preference. And what was the best story or the best experience? I mean, there, there are lots of great stories at every, at every level. I, yeah. I think, so, the, the, the most rewarding part, more than anything, was, was building good teams, mm -hmm. leading, really, an opportunity to lead and be part of a good team or to build a good team and to, and to see them go do good things. Right. And so, and you can do that, it's a little more... You know, when you're in command, like I had command of a destroyer, the Howard, and based out of San Diego, yeah. uh, 
DVG83, you know, uh, it's really great feedback because, you know, you can see exactly what you're yeah. doing when you're leaving and right. commanding a ship, etc. And uh, as you become more senior, you're more and more removed from the organization, mm -hmm. the, organization the organization becomes bigger. But you can still build, you know, so I think there was a really great, actually there was a great team. I like to think that I've always been part of really great teams and I would like to think I've helped create the environment to build them and to empower them, but also have bosses, you know, my bosses that have given me, have given me the, the flexibility and the, you know, the opportunity to go and do that. So, and I've been, that's why it was so rewarding. Now, at some point you reach in your career, it's like, it's time to go, yeah. you know, it, Sometimes it's always time to go. It's time to make room for, for someone else. And right. so I was lucky enough to, to have the opportunity to make, you know, two stars and, and go do great things. But it was also time for me to go. And so, I, okay. and I, I say that because I love being retired. I have some part-time <laughs> okay. jobs, you know, that, that keep me right. busy. But uh, part of, uh, you know, when I, when sometimes, you know, we talk work-life balance. So, mm -hmm. you know, and and sort of maintain that when you're working is really important, but sometimes you think, hey, do I work myself to death? Well, no, part of, there's the life part too, and I want to right, make sure right. I have time to, in, in my own way, the, 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 the jobs that I do in, in many respects are ways that I give back right. from my experience and help, you know, either younger sure. generations or sure. et cetera, or in this case, where we work together, we're helping, right. uh, uh, set up the the, the, uh, the commissioning of the USS uh, Telesaur Trinidad, which is a destroyer that hasn't yes. yet been built. Yes. You know, but it's named after the uh, Telesaur Trinidad, who won a Medal of Honor in uh, 1915, and so the first Filipino, right. the first uh, U.S. warship named after a Filipino American, and that's an opportunity. Vic Mercado, who's also class of '83, and others, standing on you know the or taking on the great work done by some great Americans to, 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 uh, to uh, get the ship named. And now the next step for us is to continue that, that work in the commissioning mm -hmm. of the ship. Yeah, do you want to talk about that? So the, the secretary uh, made the decision to name mm -hmm. the ship last year. There was a, a ceremony, it was in December of, of last year. But that's just the naming. There's a lot more involved in it. So do you want to both talk about how you became involved with the Telesaur Trinidad project? Um, <laughs> so the naming, you're right. It took maybe two <clears throat> years of right. campaigning, even with um, you know on the hill, right. to get right. to get the the votes there. And that team did a terrific job. Um, I didn't do a glorious. Uh, career as the admiral here, I uh, I only put in nine nine years. Okay, so you, we're, and no, so, no, we're stopping you right there. You did nine years solid. You, you didn't do only. You did nine well, years. Well, and, thank you. Thank and, you. And you came in as the first of the two Filipino Americans in the Naval Academy. You did a little more than just. Yes, yeah. And Val did six years. Okay. And I would have to say, I'll, I'll back up just a little bit. When you're going into the Naval Academy in the late 70s, I would say a good 95% of us went in to honor our fathers. There, yeah. There's not one Filipino I know in that time frame that did it to, to uh, you know, for their own um, self-gratification. In fact, the funny thing is, Mercado and, and, and my father, best friends, all, they, all we did was have to sign the name on the application. We didn't even do the application. And uh, that's how much our dads really wanted us to go. Wow. Anyway, I uh, I told my dad I'm I'm happy to do this. I will do the the what ends up being the minimum, but nine years. And then I I don't think I'm going to do a career because it just it's not it, well. Anyway, um, but then you had a very successful career in the auditing world. Yes, yes, and so I uh, effectively I became uh, a CPA mm -hmm. right after. Um, Serving, I went to University of Hawaii right after my Pearl Harbor uh, assignment there, and I, I was lucky enough to get picked up by terrific companies, KPMG, back in San Diego, Qualcomm, uh, Intuit, um, and uh, another biotech. So 
I was on the forefront of a lot of things that were changing at the time. And I felt that I could be a good leader also. And I, <clears throat> I had a, <clears throat> a lot of leadership opportunities for accountants, right. you know, and, and making sure um, things get done ethically, mm -hmm. right? And so uh, one of, <clears throat> one of my, the biggest areas of achievements was uh, being able to be part of the team that made the first cell phone. Uh, and that's really aging me. Right. That's, so, that's really, really aging me. Like, uh, look, it wasn't always looking like this. No, no, no. We <laughs> called it the brick phone. And so lots of competition between Nokia and Qualcomm. And now Qualcomm pretty much owns the whole technology of every single good or bad uh, cell phone. And then uh, my second uh, auditing uh, was with Intuit. And we moved from... TurboTax and Quicken mm -hmm. diskettes. I don't know if you all went to Costco and bought that TurboTax diskette. Yep. And then oh, we transitioned is. to the online, which is everything is going to be uh, in the cloud. So I was there to be to help transition the accounting for that piece. And so um, Mercado, you know, wanted to wanted to make sure that the numbers were right. You know, in terms of what we spend, what we receive in donations. And it's just a, a very um, uh, specific priority of his to make sure that that everything is clean in terms of the commission. And, and what you're talking about is um, the telephone. The telephone Trinidad. But right? so I, I apologize. I should have asked this question first. Once um, a ship is named, what's the process? What, what happens next? So it, it's more than a name. There there are certain certain things you. you you guys are working on together as part of this. Well, so the, I mean, the, the most important part, obviously, is the building of the ship. So, yes. so the kill is supposed to be laid in 2025. Okay. And then you know, and then there's a christening ceremony, and then then the ship will get commissioned at a home port to be determined. You know, sometime in the future. I think right now it's targeted for 2028. And so you know, there there are a couple things that there. I mean, obviously, there are a lot of ships been commissioned before, you know, but it's, uh, you know, so, so it's pretty well established. Uh, you know, every, every, every naming of a ship is, is important, you know, for the community and, and for those involved in the name of the ship. And so, you know, and so we're fortunate that Secretary Del Torres, you know, is, is recognizing <coughs> what a great, you know, service and contribution by Filipino Americans, Americans, you know, to, yes. to the country. And so, uh, you know, uh, you know, along with other communities that have been recognized in the future or in the past and in the future. But, but what we're really working is really it's a partnership with there's many other organizations involved in the commissioning of ship. The Navy League is a significant, you know, partner in the Navy. You know, and the shipbuilder they're all significant <coughs> partners in the community. Mm -hmm. You know, and so, but this isn't free. You know, and so right. some money has to be raised. You know, to actually, you know, host the event and uh, recognize the crew, and, and then have a have a nice event for uh, for those participating in the crew, and then at the same time, in the you know, to be able to raise enough money to be able to continue to support the ship and the crew, and the you know, after the ship is commissioned, and then for us, I you know, there are a couple things that one we we, we want to do it in a way that is reflective of of. Trinidad service, you know, so neat, you know, with the dignity and respect, and but and the class act is the way I would describe it, and then uh, and and also in recognition of uh, you know Filipino Americans, and then and to educate actually uh, America sailors, you know, about Filipino Americans, and and I think that's an important part of you know my background, my because I don't you know. It really wasn't until my exposure to the Navy, and I'm still learning about Filipino culture and what Filipino Americans have done, even you know now mm -hmm. that I'm 62 years old. And so it's sort of a continuing education part. And so I think that's something that the commissioning committee feels is important, right. is an education of what Filipino, Filipino Americans as citizens, but even also probably even writ large what Filipinos have done in terms of how they've supported the United States. As, as you know, it's sort of a, Complicated relationship between the Philippines and the United States is, I mean, certainly here, you know, at the Navy History and Heritage Command, you understand it completely. 
Yes. And so, uh, so we, we want to be a part of that. So uh, what are your thoughts on how you're going to be educating folks? So we have 100 plus years of Filipino-American service in the United States Navy. Um, most Filipinos started out as stewards mm -hmm. because that was a decision that policymakers made. And it, so the majority of the first generation were stewards, and then after that, people progressed to, quite frankly, where you are, mm -hmm. so you're, you're a two-star. Um, so uh, how do you envision educating people about the line of history? Because again, it, it's over 100 years. Is it, it something you've been thinking about um, as part of the christening of the ship, or maybe just in, in general, of how do you help the Navy tell the story of Filipino-American service? Yes. Yes. Okay. That's a good right. Question. So, so just, yeah. Right. So part. So part of our approach is we have, you know, in our in our larger approach to this is a, what I would describe sort of my planning background mm -hmm. as a line of effort that is an education, okay. and we have not yet identified everything we want to do. A lot of it is a, is in some respects continuing what is what is sort of ongoing. Mm -hmm. I can't name them on, but you know, for example, like the. I can't remember the name of the group, but with the Bataan Death March and how every year they, yes. they do that. Right, yeah. right, exactly. With the uh, you know the the Congressional Gold Medal recognition that that was done, you know, and, and so and you know continuing that, but also coming up and coming up with you know additional creative ideas to, to expand that education because as you know, just as as again the History Command you know works real hard is you know we. How often does the Chief of Naval Operations say that history is really important to how we fight in the future? Yes. You know, yes. but how hard is it to actually teach history to yeah. even the officers' corps to the Navy at large, or where they have time to sort of think about it, do the research, right. and figure out how to apply it? You know, and so that's sort of where we are in our stage right now. Is there programs that we're con we'll, we'll continue that we can either support or be a part of, but uh, coming up with some new ones is some work to be done right. still for the committee. Okay. Who are your heroes and heroines in the Filipino American mm. community? Who would you be like, all right, I need to talk to that. I, I want to talk to this person, or I wish somebody had to talk to this person if that person is deceased? You know, uh, someone that comes to mind is a friend of mine, a classmate of yours, Bobette Bobobar. Oh Remember? yes, yeah. yeah. And she's she's Filipino. She's from California. Um, we were friends. She was two years behind <clears throat> me as well. Right, class of eighty five. She was uh, uh, a navy diver. Right. right. I mean, warfare. That's as warfare as right. you can get. Yeah. Yeah. And she became a uh, rear admiral. Uh, she was a rear admiral, and I can't remember. I know she had command of. Uh, I can't remember the name of. The the Guam area, Guam and right, that right, regional area. Right, but she started off. She had to learn diving herself. I mean, you know, with, you know, with all of the other gentlemen that were normally part of that field, and so, it's not just just the the ship that right. goes along with that, but everything else that goes along with with the diving. And I was quite impressed that she was able to, uh, to secure that. Uh, you know, type of war for a designation, designation, and then right. to make admiral rank. So I, I have to jump in here. So okay. I want to add a little context here, you know, from my perspective. So the class of '83, class of eight, you know, '84, '85. That that time frame, the the earlier classes that had yes. women, and I and I want to throw in, you know, the ink, you know, the the nominated CNO Admiral Frank Hitties, you know, time frame because she's part of that cohort mm -hmm. right. that the, the Navy was certainly, you know, sexist, mm -hmm. okay, in the 80s, okay. You, you could say there's probably elements that are still being combated today, but certainly compared to the mm -hmm. 80s, women could not serve on combatants at the time. Right. You know, and so, you know, so, so, so they were, you know, pioneers in terms of, as you yes. well know here, you know, and yes. so, so it was, in my opinion, when I say it was difficult, you know, to be successful because, in some respects, the system was not, uh, shall mm -hmm. we say, favorably inclined to uh, to women's success. So let's let's drop some <clears throat> anchors, like look for milestones. So first academy class of women was 
80. That's right. And everybody who graduated uh, was an unrestricted line officer. Women could not serve on combatant mm -hmm. ships. And that class was about three years after the lawsuit with Yona Owens suing to let women go to sea. Mm. So there was a lot of churn. So you, you're, you're graduating, right? You're possibly maybe going out. So when you shared your bio with me, you said you went unrestricted line, but the year uh, Valerie went SWAT, uh, surface warfare, right? But she also went one one of the first, and, mm -hmm. and we also got to share that. When women went out, it's not like the ships were built for men and women. That's right. That's right. The ships were all built for men, mm -hmm. and so they were converting them over while you were trying to go out there, and you really were at the front end of that spear. Yeah, and I right. would say bulkheads really was just <clears throat> right. And the so, for example, where I went to a combatant yeah. like a cruiser. Right. Women, those were not open for women mm -hmm. at the time because sort of across all the U.S. military, women were not allowed to serve in combat right. roles. And so, so they yeah. went to important roles, but they would be, you know, in the auxiliary forces, et cetera. Right. And then later on when we competed, you know, as for like department head, you would, they, you know, going to sea is, is the most important part. But, you know, right. you have someone who goes to a combatant as a cruiser or destroyer, you know, and it's more challenging at times to go and say, well, I was on an oiler and I did a great job. Yeah. But you got to do different things. Right. Again, it wasn't. And so I think it, nowadays, from, from my perspective, mm -hmm. sort of having been part of promotion boards or selection boards, et cetera, I think that, that those days are past. But, but the, the, this, you know, Rowena's group, you know, the, yes. that group, as you just highlighted, there's some challenges there that, that they've had to overcome. And so... So I go back and and I, the reason I just wanted to jump in and there is say and just is to recognize you know that that it, it it took a really tough personality and a high performer you know to deal yes. with the discrimination yes. you know to, to be able to go and succeed. So I go back to the credit. and it's it's yes. gentlemen you know. yes <clears throat> like Pat here that were crucial to our success because you know there was a good 50% of the guys that wanted us to leave and 50% that wanted us to stay so uh, when I was a plea there was a there was a particular uh, forestall lecture where we had the chief of naval operations come in and one of the women who was uh, third class asked well, why is the first class of women in 1980, why are they assigned only desk jobs? And um, as opposed to right. fighting alongside our, our right. male counterparts. Right. And he, um, he said, quote unquote, women can't fight. The chief of naval operations. And again, this is 1979, mm -hmm. and he was quoting um, something from a book that was from the assistant secretary. Navy at the yeah. time. So those two gentlemen basically ran the Navy. Uh, and when that comment was made, there was rousing standing ovations from most most of the men. Mm -hmm. And here, you know, here I am as a plebe and I'm in my roommates and I were thinking, oh, well, we're going to have a long haul the next four years. Yeah. Uh, and so Unfortunately, our women, we had a, an attrition rate of 41%, uh, which is the highest in the history of the Naval Academy. And in fact, 1983 happened to be the highest attrition rate for West Point and um, Air Force Academy. So that, that um, kind of obviously flowed, that comment kind of flowed to impact those branches as well. So uh, yeah, it was, it was challenging. It was, it was very challenging. and. Uh, you know, we, we had to really stick together, um, although um, it really was the, the roommate, the strength right. of the roommates and the strength of the company mates right. within your class that really made it, or, or you know, make or break uh, the, the success of one's yeah. stay there for female in the right. early uh, 80s and so forth. Well, I, I want to say thank you. I mean, I, I'm your group 95. I was a Coast Guard officer. Oh, and I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm, um, 
I was able to come in and do certain things because of what you and your classmates were doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, you made sure that my year group um, had the ability to serve on combatants. You were the one saying, you know, we are, we want equality. So I had to say thank you. Yeah. But that's why I was so excited to interview you. you were like, oh. oh my God, you are one of the first. And, and, and so, you know, my generation and then my daughter's generation has the ability to look at this soon to be um, CNO, but already yes. Coast Guard Commandant, as it woman, really? and say, I can do this. Mm -hmm. And it, it's a continuum. They could, they could do these things because of yeah. what you do. Yeah. Thank you. And then, and then I believe the permanent superintendent for the Naval Academy yes, is also going to be. Like, so, right, yeah, I mean, yeah, but I mean, once that all gets right, once but that's, we're confirmed. That, that's right. what you, when you just said, I only did nine years. I'm looking at you like, come on, <laughs> the four you did at the academy were, were incredible for women in the military. Yes, Jim, say thank you for that. Well, thank you. Thank yeah, you. That's I mean, that's me. that's huge for everybody, and then. So, for folks watching this, uh, th this video is posted on the, on, uh, the National Museum of the United States Navy Facebook account, but we also share it because uh, our videos are viewed by students at the academy mm -hmm. because we want them to hear the history of the Navy, sure. but we also want to inspire them. And you two are both inspirational leaders. I mean, you're, when you talk about your work at UCOM and PACOM and being a CEO, I mean, yeah, that's... That's what a lot of these young ones want to do, and they want to be you. And the young ones so, want to be you, too. To, just to continue on that thread, and so, it's funny, I, I sort of joke that my best friend, and you know, I was his best man, and he was my best man, to the day he, you know, we have disagreements on, you know, women in the, in the military, mm -hmm. okay? And so, you know, and what I always argued ultimately is that, you know, in this case, is if an American citizen wants an opportunity to fight and or serve their country, why should they be denied that? Mm, right. And so, you know, but the key is more than anything is that it's, for us, you know, we have to be able to go fight and win. Yes. You know, so in other words, you know, it's a credible combat capability. It's not, you know, it's not, it's not, it can't be, you know, paper you know, tight, you know, and so, but my first command, my, the first time I served with, was women when I was, when I took command of a destroyer. Mm -hmm. All my ships previously had no women, and, and I, I can categorically state that I had a ship of American sailors mm -hmm. that could fight and win, and when I went back to cruiser command, it was the same, right. and some of my best performing junior officers were, were women. And so, but again, you know, the, and and as a very, and both crews were very, you know, were diverse, and you know, and so, so I know there's a lot of discussion, you know, in today's, you know, back and forth. But I would go and say there are a lot of great Americans from all parts of the country, you know, every every aspect of diversity, right. who who volunteered to serve and are doing great, and are. Are parts of ships and squadrons and commands that are going to go, and if they are well led, mm -hmm. which I would go and mm -hmm. say, knowing the senior leadership they are, yeah. they're going to, you know, they're going to win, you know. But I, you know, so I, you know, there might be, you know, these stories that are trying to torpedo it, but I would say they don't have practical experience if they don't even know these sailors. Right. Yeah. They don't know these ships. They don't know the sailors, and it's just sad to see. These pot shots taken mm. to a, a, against a service services that are on the whole, okay. You know they're the ones that are out there, you know, on watch, right? And yeah. they're they are doing good things. And so I, you know, I, I since I have an opportunity to say that, I want to say that because, but I've seen that trans that transition over the years. I mean, it's been, and I and I and I'm not going to go and say we need to be satisfied with where we are, either. You know, in terms of dealing with, you know, still discrimination or what might be institutional or cultural change that need mm. that need to change. You know, that still need to change, and so that that work needs to continue. But to become a more perfect union means we need to continue to work and not just sort of rest on our laurels. Sure. Yeah. So. I agree. Well, I've asked you a lot of questions. <coughs> um, I and I, I 
I just ask one question is, is there anything I should have asked you about? Is there any story that you said, hey, I came here to tell you that story, but you haven't asked me about it today? So, so I'll, I'll start with, how about, all right, I'll start with you, Arvina. Is there anything you want to share? Because you said I, you wanted to talk about your dad, and your dad was part of an amazing group of individuals. Do you mm -hmm. want to spend a few more minutes talking about him? Um, I think I talked about him quite, <laughs> okay. quite a lot. I think he, yeah. he's such a humble and quiet guy. Yeah. I, I think you would say, don't go any further. Okay. I, I would like to reiterate just how wonderful the support of my male counterparts in my company and in my class were. Um, it, I went to the reunion, 40th reunion this weekend. Mm -hmm. That was my first reunion that I've ever come back to. And the, and the guys there, just embraced me emotionally and they were just so happy to see me as I was with them. Um, some of the some of the stories that the other woman would share um, in other companies, you know, I was just, we were just lucky that we had just great brothers, brothers in arms. And, and, I, and I told them all that and that they were probably the main reason why Three of the six did graduate, you know, from from the academy. And at the time, we were all in the same company all four years. We didn't have the switcheroo, or, and so we really got to know these gentlemen very well. And now they're spouses and children. But I mean, they they mean the world to me, and I I just wanted to to reiterate that and give another shout out to those guys. All right. So it's a class of '83. Class of 83, 30th company. All right. So mine, mine sort of, uh, so when, when I filled out my ethnicity when I was younger, I put down my Caucasian. And the, the reason I did that is I wanted to compete as Patrick Piercy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And so, but as I became older, I sort of said, I probably, I should have put down either, you know, I should have identified ethnicity. You know, I'm, I'm an American, you know, but I, I should take credit for being Asian American. You know, and, and so, so sort, of, sort of why. So part of that was just simply, you know, I came to understand, I mean, and I sort of, when I was younger, you know, someone always, or they would ask, well, were you discriminated against when you grew up? I mean, I grew up, you know, I'd say from junior high on in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I'd say I, was, I never felt discriminated against. Now, my brother, who was a year and a half younger, he did, you know, but I was half, you know, I was half Filipino, and so, but I was, I, and I'm happy to say this, I was a geek. Okay. You know, so, I mean, so I sort of joke, I was not discriminating any more than other geeks or other schools, okay. you know, and so, so, but I wanted to go and say, hey, on my own merits, I want to be able to compete, uh, but as I get, as I said, as I got older, I wanted to say no. I want to identify as Asian American because I do recognize now, as I became older, you know, I, maybe when I was more ideal when I was younger, the reality is there there do need to be role models. We need the services we need. We do need to take credit for the fact that there are minorities, you know, or 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 from an ethnicity background. We, you know, the, the Navy should get credit for its diversity, and if I report, you know, as, as Caucasian, mm -hmm. then we're not, we're not getting credit. But I should also make sure, you know, I, I'm, uh, you know, available as a role model. But also, part of it is also, in a way, is like, I wish I knew more about my, my culture. Right. I wish I knew more about being, you know, Filipino, and I'm, you know, a bit from... You know, I, I learned how to make adobo for my mother, you know, but there, there are things in the Filipino yeah, we've got community to teach you. They're from the Filipino <laughs> culture side that I didn't have a chance to experience. And I said, hey, that's actually part of my heritage that I don't, that it's, that's a gap. And so over the years, I've been slowly but not probably fast enough sort of filling that gap. And it's not, it's not that it doesn't make me feel whole. I still feel whole, but hey, it's an important part. But again, part of, as I've also gotten older, I would like to say I appreciate it. Well, I'm, I'm becoming more and more a believer in diversity because the diversity brings, and, 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 I, and I'm, I'm, I say in all aspects, of, brings such richness to life and creativity and ideas that actually is what makes it 
one, fun, enjoyable, but I think that also continues to make the United States competitive in a mm -hmm. very dangerous world is mm -hmm. because, you know, we, it's, the creative spirit that we have here is actually continues to keep us, you know, as we sort of fight off either the PRC or the Russians or authoritarian regimes, and we need, and so, but that's the valuing of the diversity and the richness. I, you know, I, I would think, yeah, if, if everything was always the same, it, I would, I think we lose out of the richness of, of life of the world, mm -hmm. and by being part of the Navy, I've, I've had a chance to see that and actually, mm -hmm. you know, experience it, and so I, so I emphasize, again, that by traveling around the world as being part of the Navy, by going to the Naval Academy, my experience is just giving me a greater appreciation of how valuable differences are. That goes the same with the <clears throat> Fortune 500 companies right. in almost every aspect. The diversity is uh, so uh, important. I, so. You know, I, I did want to also mention that I'm so proud of the new Filipino midshipmen that are going through here. I'm meeting with them. We're meeting with them later this, right, and not, and, uh, this, this, right, month. this month. Right, and I'm just so excited to talk about, you know, what they want to do, right. right? And these are the crop of kids that are going to go full on mm -hmm. warfare. They they're going to take your route. The women too. Yes. Right. Yes. And I am just so thrilled and excited to to see that and to 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 hear what they want to do and what what they want to achieve. All right. Every door is open to them. Yeah. Everybody now. Thank you very much for joining me today at the National Museum of the United States Navy. You're welcome. Thank yeah. you. I'm thank fine. you for sharing I'm your fine. stories. And, and, uh, uh, and, and thank you to everybody who's watching today. It, again, we're lucky to have these two individuals sharing their stories. This is a continuum of storytelling that we do at the National Museum of the United States Navy. And a shout out to David Barker, who's behind the camera right now taping us. And everyone. Thank you for joining us, and I think I need to say, Go Navy, Beat Army.